And I mean, how important a role do you think encryption plays in the go forward landscape of all this? Because I think a lot of people tend to think about, you know, if I have a house and I have an impenetrable wall, then all the stuff I have in my house can be, you know, safely stored. But actually, that may not be really true because if if you think you have an impenetrable wall, we now know that a, a piece of malware can come in and basically take all the stuff inside of your house and not allow you having access to it. But if all of it were separately encrypted, then you've dramatically mitigated your risk. So encryption then must play a gigantic role in, in value attribution to everything you own. It's not, if data is the world's most valuable asset now, then wouldn't encryption be the most important aspect to protect that data that's the world's most valuable asset? Absolutely. And, and, and you just nailed it because as we get more into cloud distributed and higher functionality systems, the perimeters disappear. So really, you can, if you can access your data anywhere, anyplace, anytime, so can the attacker. So, so really this concept of prevention and building brick walls and uh, firewalls and moats really have disappeared and where things are heading. And it's all about your data, no matter where it is, needs to be protected, secured, encrypted. And like you said, the best way to do it is to take a play out of the attacker's playbook and use distributed methods. So your data not only doesn't exist in one spot, but even if you did get it in one spot, you get one piece, not millions upon millions of records. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's just, uh, it seems like such an important thing. And, you know, and then also, what about the whole NIST protocol on these different encryptions that they thought were going to be quantum resistant. There were five finalists and then three that were sort of the recommendations. And out of the five that were finalists, I think three already cracked, which is, uh, I mean, in, in with standard computers in like, you know, less than two days or three days. One of them was 53 hours. The other one was like 20 something hours. I don't remember exactly. But w what do you think about this? Yeah, th that one was very, not only puzzling, but very, very concerning to me because NIST with their crypto bake-offs that they do and, and their challenges usually get very high quality algorithms. So if you go back and look at some of the symmetric, asymmetric ones out there, all of the finalists were solid. I mean, they were all really good choices and they had to pick one, but uh, ultimately any one of them were solid. Here, you have a situation where you're five finalists and three of them were broken with minimal effort. So it sort of makes you step back and scratch your head going, are the adversaries and counterattacks getting so good or are the people that's building the crypto no longer saying we want to play with NIST and doing it on their own in commercial and basically trying to take the government out of it and, and knowing the researchers out there, I think it's more of the latter where people are like, okay, we let the government try to do this for a while and look at the mess we're in. We're going to go and solve this on the commercial front. So I think less and less people want to play with NIST and just want to solve it independently. Interesting. Interesting. But, you know, that's why we chose one-time pad as an approach, right, at Crown Sterling, because one-time pad encryption is not a mathematical equation. If it's really used one time, single use, then there's no way that you can – there's not an equation or quadratic function or otherwise that you could utilize to be able to decipher it. And, you know, that that's the, the thing that's most uh, appealing about this. It's not based on number theory. It's based on information theory. So is that, is that why you're a fan of one time pad as well? Exactly. Cause like you said, multiple benefits. One is it's used to protect one record. So even if you get it, you get the one record, but the extra benefit from just uh, single key encryption is the one time pad aspect, which is, so you get my key, not only do you get one record, but when I re-encrypt it, you no longer get the record again. So you get the one record for one single instance. And now you look at it from an attacker standpoint of level and effort and energy for me to try to break in and steal data. And all of a sudden it's no longer a viable option. The reason why ransomware and extortion are viable options is because they're easy. Once we make them harder, they will stop being viable options to the attacker. Interesting, interesting. So if the company, what, what percentage of the ransomware cases 
were data at rest that were already encrypted. So before the ransomware got into it and then encrypted again, right? What percentage was already encrypted generally? I, I, I would have to guess, but it, it would probably be, I would say upper 90% because almost wow. all data that's out there is encrypted at some level. It's just not encrypted very, very well. Now you could argue that if it was encrypted really well, they could still go in and do ransomware, but they wouldn't be able to do extortion because they could just re-encrypt it but never get access to it. But the fact that they're switching from ransom to extortion, which requires decryption, shows you not only that it's encrypted, but how bad and how poor the key management is that they're able to get access to the data and switch it from a ransom to an extortion attack almost instantaneously. So it's almost like a company nowadays and individuals too need to have a backup storage of, you know, it, and it could be on a cloud or something or otherwise, so that any, any of their non-local data that's stored on clouds or in blockchains or whatever would be enough that they, if they got ransomware, they could access it and be able to use it to operate their, their businesses Big and up. their day-to-day -day lives. So everyone needs a backup that's also encrypted. And then not not let anyone know where that backup is. Right. And encrypted with some form of multi-key or one-time pad encryption. Yeah. That seems like the solution. How expensive it is for is it for people to do that? Let's say that I needed to set up a, on a cloud, you know, something like 10 terabytes of data just to make sure I got all my family's data. I just had this big problem on Apple where I passed my two terabyte limit on <laughs> Apple. Oh my gosh, what a nightmare this has been. I cannot believe how difficult it was because then I went to go to get a new phone and I couldn't even image the new phone, right? Because <laughs> I was at my limit. So then I had to buy an external hard drive and it takes forever to transfer all these files over. It's been a two week process and I'm still not finished with it. But, but how expensive is it for people to do that? Or is it just a very tedious process? So the real question is not how expensive is it to do it? How expensive is it not to do it? Because okay, fair enough. What are you going to pay with ransom? And, and in our estimate, with most companies and individuals, it's about to do to back up your data and protect it correctly, is usually about a tenth of what you would pay for a ransom payment. So if a company is going to pay a three million dollar ransom, usually it would have cost them around three to four hundred k to fix or address mm -hmm. the problem in the first place. So it's really showing, and we do the math for companies, is proactive is going to be a lot cheaper than reactive. Fair enough. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, what do you think is likely to happen in the security industry then with all this change that's happening with quantum computing and otherwise, and you know this higher risk associated with multi-threading? Do you think pretty much all of, is everything under review now on how you do security? Because I think there's got to be a very high degree of distrust amongst consumers as well as, you know, at the corporate level, because I'm sure CEOs are like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about all this stuff that we think is totally secure, but there's like obvious back doors on everything. Yeah, yeah. we're basically looking at rethinking and redesigning everything, because if you look at most of the security and most of the developments over the last 10 years, we're all on prevention and detection of attacks and nothing to do with our data. Like all the stuff on behavioral analytics and AI and cross correlation and we can detect new attacks and we can detect advanced phishing. All of that is great at some level, but the fundamental, as you said, is the data is the new digital economy and we have ignored data security. We have done cybersecurity, we've done endpoint security, we've done network security, but data security has been this ignored area for too long and now companies are realizing with the internet the cloud the tablets and everything out there the only thing that is going to matter in the future is data security so now everyone's scrambling of saying okay how do we actually properly protect secure our data because we've done everything but protect the core information over the last 15 20 years wow 